we're going to first review the uh, the basic two thermodynamic cycles that we know uh, or that we should have seen uh, in an advanced engineering undergraduate course um, that are pertinent to uh, internal combustion engines. So if you remember, I'm going to draw here our piston cylinder assembly, our typical you know, prototypical piston cylinder assembly. Zoop, and here's our, this is actually quite, not quite the nice cylinder we want. So here, I'm just going to make it a little bit straighter. So here's my cylinder. And inside the cylinder is a piston. I'm going to draw it like this. It's, I'm drawing it as a puck. This is a, a flat, you know, a flat topped piston. And there's a flat. So this is here the, what we call the piston crown. Um, that is uh, flat and circular. Here is what we call the piston head. And again, I'm saying that this is flat and circular. This is actually a, a, an idealization. Uh, we're going to discuss this during the course. And uh, this piston is going to move up and down like this throughout the cycle. And it's actually typically connected through a, a connecting rod and then a crank arm to some rotational shaft. Oh, this is a little bit offside. Here, let's draw it. So our, our rotational, this, this black dot at the bottom here, this is the location of the, the rotational axis that is going to transfer work to the transmission and then the rest of the vehicle. And then there's a, so there's a crank arm like that. And there's a connecting rod. Here's a little bowed out in this case, but it doesn't actually matter. So this is what, this is what actually what transfers our linear motion up and down of the piston into rotational motion at the crankshaft like this. Okay, so the net effect of this whole mechanism is that the piston moves up and down from the top to what we call the top dead center. So here when the piston is all the way at the top at, it, at its topmost position, I'm going to draw it out dashed here. Then this is called the top dead center. That's the, the top dead center that is the uh, smallest smallest volume and it's the topmost position. And then there's an equivalent bottom position here. This is the bottom most position or what we call bottom dead center. And this is the largest volume. This is the bottom most position. The furthest down. Here's, there's acronyms that we always use, bottom dead center. We'll call it BDC, top dead center. We'll call it TDC. Or you'll sometimes see TC for just top center, BC for bottom center. Okay, so the whole point of the mechanism is that it makes the piston move up and down throughout the cylinder, making the volume alternately very small to very large to very small again, and then it just keeps repeating like this. Okay, so our basic uh, cycles come into four phases. And this is going to be true for, uh, well, this is, we're going to discuss mostly the four stroke cycles in this course, um, although, um, the same theory applies to uh, two-stroke uh, cycles. Uh, it's just that some of the steps are sort of mushed together. They happen at the same motion. So the four basic, so the four basic, or the, here, let me not call it four basic. So I'm just going to say the basic, uh, the basic steps of reciprocating reciprocating, and that should be an I, reciprocating cycles. So we start with, let's see, we start with the piston at the topmost position, and we have one valve that opens. So typically, we'll have valves 
on the top. So here I draw these as the, these are the, the puppet valves. So typical what we call puppet valves is these small circular, small disc-like valves with a long stem that are gonna get pushed in in order to open and then pushed back out in order to close. So the, the stem goes through, so there's a hole inside of the inside of the head and then the stem actually fits in inside of here and then the valve is actually on the inside here. So when the valve goes up, it seals against the hole and, and closes the path. So when we start, um, so when we start the cycles, we're going to start the cycle, the, the volume, we're going to start at the smallest volume. And then we'll open, we're going to open the intake valve. We're going to open the valve that allows either air or fresh fuel mixture to come in. Or I should say, instead of one, we're going to say start at the smallest volume, step one open oops open intake valve or we'll, we'll often abbreviate this by i v o intake valve open and then we'll say draw in fresh fluid um and this could be um well, yeah, draw in fresh fluid. So this could be either air in the case of a diesel engine, or it could be a mixture of air and fuel if this was a auto cycle. Um, once we've drawn in our fresh fluid, then we have, uh, then we close the intake valve. Close the intake valve, or what we'll call IVC, intake valve closing. And then we, once the intake valve is closed, now we have our fresh fluid inside of the cylinder, then all the valves are closed. So now we have a closed system. We're gonna push, we're gonna push the piston back up. So push piston up towards the small volume. Um, once the piston has been pushed all the way up towards a small volume, then we're going to have some kind of combustion process. And I'm staying purposefully vague here uh, because I want to describe these steps so that they apply both to an auto cycle engine or a diesel cycle engine. And then we're going to, we're going to clarify these as we review those two cycles. Um, so we have some kind of combustion process. This allows us to release chemical energy into uh, thermal energy, thermal or, or internal energy. Um, and then we have a work extraction process. So then we have high pressure gas in the system pushes the piston towards the bottom center. So actually I should, here I've said in the system and I actually kind of omitted to show what my system was. So I'm just going to here in, in dashed black lines, these are positions of, uh, of my piston at the extrema, right at the topmost position, at the bottom most position, I'm gonna draw in a dashed red line, the actual thermodynamic system that I'm considering. So this dashed, there shouldn't be a, like this. So this dashed red line, is my thermodynamic system. And it consists of all the gas inside the cylinder. So obviously I've drawn this dash red line. So this is my system. When the piston is at the position outlined by uh, the straight uh, or the full lines. Right. Obviously, when the piston goes up, the size of my system shrinks 
all the way down to like a, a, a tiny sleeve, very, very small. And when my piston moves down, the volume or the size of my system increases. Okay. So we've said the high pressure gas. So after there's some kind of combustion process, then there's some kind of work production process, right? My, my system now contains high pressure gas or very, very high pressure gas. And then it pushes the piston down. So that actually, by pushing the piston down, that force transmits work or transmits energy to that rotational shaft. And this is what actions my whole mechanism. And then we go to bottom dead center where we've extracted as much energy as we can. And then we have the, we have the, the, the piston comes up and then there's actually, it's kind of through inertia, the piston is going to come up. Actually, I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open the, the, I'm going to open the exhaust valve. So that's the valve that literally is it, it, it connects to the exhaust. It connects to the to the the uh, to the, the the exhaust pipe of your car. So I'm going to open the exhaust valve, or what we'll call EVO exhaust valve open. Eight. The piston will move up. Piston moves up towards uh, top center. And when we get to top center, then we close, close the exhaust valve. Or E, V, C, exhaust valve close. And then we restart, then we go, then you rinse, repeat, right? So come back up all the way up to one, and then you repeat the process. And now we have a cycle. So we have a thermodynamic cycle. Okay. That defines four different what we call strokes. So we have the opening of the intake valve and drawing in of the fresh fluid. That is what we call the intake stroke or the intake phase. I'm drawing in fresh fluid that can be burnt. So from here, oh, I'm going to here, I'm going to switch color. I put them in purple. So from here to here, this is what we call the intake phase or stroke. So that's the intake stroke where I'm drawing in fluid. When we, then once we've drawn in the fluid, we close the intake valve. Then the piston goes up towards the smaller volume, towards top center. But what it does is since all of the valves are closed and that is compressing the gas. So that is what we call the compression stroke. So out here up until here, I'm gonna put it loosely here. It's actually not at five, it's sort of on five or around five. That is the compression stroke or the compression phase. So we're raising the pressure inside of the thermodynamic system, inside of my fluid. Then I have some kind of combustion process and we then go, and then the high pressure gas pushes the piston towards the bottom center. And that is what we call the power or expansion stroke. And then when we open the exhaust valve, the piston comes back up and then it pushes the fluid out. That is gonna be, we had the intake stroke and we're gonna have the exhaust stroke. Out here, this is the exhaust, exhaust stroke. And that is what defines the four stroke. This is stroke one, stroke two, stroke three, stroke four. Right? This is what defines, so we have the intake stroke, compression, expansion, and then exhaust stroke. So each stroke is actually one displacement of the piston, like this. Um, yes, so this is one, oh. so stroke one, two, three, and four. What we could uh, generally uh, term as being the, so this is uh, another professor in the department 
uh, likes to say. So the intake stroke is his suck in, compression stroke is squeeze the fluid. And then you have the expansion stroke is bang. This is where we have the expansion bang. And then you blow it out. So suck in, squeeze, bang, and blow out. That's it. OK, so these are our four stroke. And we have these for both uh, what we call auto cycle and diesel cycle. And if you, uh, if you don't quite remember, uh, what these refer to. So here, I'm just going to close all. Yeah, I'm going to clear all the drawing. So these four, so these define the four, whoops. Wrong color. So these uh, processes define four stroke engines. And let's see, so these processes define four stroke engines. What we mean is when we say four stroke engines is that one thermodynamic cycle happens over four strokes or four displacements of the piston from one end to the other. Okay, and these occur for both auto cycle and or they occur in both auto cycle and diesel cycle devices. Uh, auto cycle is auto, not the, not the car. Auto was a German dude. Um, this is, uh, so here I'm going to make a note. This is German engineer. The auto cycle is what is typically used for gasoline powered engines. And it's typically what we think of when we say, or it's typically uh, also what we call spark ignited engines. The diesel cycle, these use diesel fuel. And we also call them compression ignition engines. So let's draw below what are, we like to draw these in PV and pressure volume. Actually, I'm going to, I'm going to use the straight line tool so it looks a little bit better. So here's one axis. Here's the other one. So I'm going to draw it in PV and oh, let's draw it in TS as well. Here's here, let's do a second. Oh, let's do a second plot. There we go. Then we'll do plots over here as well. Like that. One, two, then three axes, four axes. There we go. So this is pressure, volume. We're going to put little arrows so they're actually plots. I somehow I've lost my touch with the having not lectured for a month and a half. I lost my touch with the trackpad. There we go. And this is going to be temperature entropy. Here's pressure volume temperature. Entropy. Okay, so the plots on the left refer to auto cycle, the gasoline uh, running engines or spark ignited engines. The plots on the right, they refer to diesel cycle or diesel fuel powered engines or compression ignition engines. Those are synonymous, those different terms. All right, uh, so let's represent on our PV diagram and our TS diagram what are actual uh, four different strokes or what are all of our different processes uh, actually uh, uh, of how they how they uh, occur through from a dynamic space so remember so one uh, we're going to define and this is true for both so here i'm going to draw my cylinder it's the same thermodynamic system in both cases that is here i'm going to draw it in red again my system is 
all of the gas contained within the cylinder. That is the thermodynamic system that is under consideration. So what does that mean? That means that when I'm drawing a pressure and volume point, so for example, at state one, I'm going to take at state one, well, process one was opening the intake valve. So that means we're at the smallest volume. So the volume is small and the pressure is also low. It's basically ambient pressure right there. Okay. So when I draw this state, when I draw this point, that is the pressure and the volume of the gas inside of my thermodynamic system. And I have the same thing here right there. And we're going to term these, this is VTDC. This is the volume at top dead center. And we have the intake stroke. Well, the intake stroke is, is ideally, I mean, I'm just checking. So what we're reviewing now, maybe I should mention, is the idealized thermodynamic cycles for the auto cycle and the diesel cycle. So I'm, I'm, I'm sucking in air. So basically I'm moving the piston out. Well, the, the pressure doesn't really have time to go down, right? When the, when the piston pulls down, the pressure wants to go down, but the intake valve is open. So it just sucks in. You just have air coming in. It just, it just starts, it just starts filling it up. It's the same thing. If you take a syringe and you dunk it in water and then you start pulling it, you're not, I mean, you're, you're doing work because you, you're sucking in water, but the pressure inside the syringe is just atmospheric pressure. Right? When I, when I pull the syringe out of the water, the water doesn't spritz everywhere. The, the pressure inside of there is the ambient, is the ambient pressure. So the volume goes up and we are taking in. So the volume goes up ideally all the way down to V BDC. These are the limit. These are the limit positions, topmost position, bottom most position. And then we're always going in between these two. Okay. So out here we have intake valve open intake stroke. intake valve close and we have the same thing for the diesel cycle that part is exactly the same v b d c all right we've sucked in material we close the intake valves now all the valves are closed and now we compress the material well now when the piston comes in it starts pushing it in the pressure has to go up uh, like this. So this is the compression stroke. And the same thing happens for the diesel cycle. Compression. It's this line over here. All right. And this is where now the, the differences actually here, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to fix this. There are no numbers, right? These are just sketches. So I'm just going to draw this as going higher just so it gives me more room to play with. Okay. So we have the compression, and now this is where the differences occur. So in the auto cycle, when I'm doing the intake stroke, what I'm pulling in is actually a mixture of air and gasoline. So in the duct ahead of the cylinder, we are actually sending in gasoline already. So when I'm sucking in, this is a combustible mixture of air and gasoline. And in order to burn, so we've sucked it in and we compress it. And in order to burn, this is why we call AutoCycle the spark ignition engine, is that when we're at top dead center or near top dead center, there's an actual spark. There's a spark plug and it goes and it makes a little spark inside. And this is what sets off a flame that then burns I'm going to say very rapidly or relatively rapidly throughout the whole volume and it raises the temperature and the pressure very fast. So out here, I'm going to put a little star. Wow, that's the ugliest star I've ever drawn. There we go. A little boom, explodes. And then very quickly, this should, be a, a, this should be a straight line. I'm going to take the straight line tool. 
So very rapidly we burn, there we go, to a high pressure and high temperature. So this is combustion. Intake, close the intake valve, compress, bang, burns, push. So now we have high, very high, high pressure gases. They push onto the piston, which then moves down to the bottom position. So this is now expansion or power stroke. And then we open the exhaust valve, exhaust valve open. And well, what happens is a blow down. It goes, I open the intake valve. The pressure is very high. Then it just, I'm going to make a slightly, this is actually on purpose. I'm going to make a, a, a I'm going to make a squiggly line there. Uh, this is the, this is not the exhaust stroke. This is the, the blow down. When you open the exhaust valve, it, it just, it just, the pressure just releases relatively fast. And then we have the exhaust stroke Then we have the piston comes back up and it pushes the material out. And then we close the intake valve, EVC. So there's two lines here. One goes this way, one goes that way, like that. And then we can start the process again. The exhaust valve closes, the intake valve opens, and then we start sucking in again. Now for the uh, diesel cycle, the combustion is not instantaneous. For the diesel cycle, what we do is we don't intake a mixture of fuel and air. We intake just pure air, no fuel, no diesel fuel yet. So we just intake air, close the intake valve. This is pure air. I can compress this as much as I want. It turns out there's a limit. We're going to talk about this during the course, but there's a limit to how much you can compress uh, um, uh, an auto cycle engine. And so for the, for the diesel cycle, I, I don't have, it's just air. I can compress this as much as I want. And as a result, the diesel engines, they tend to have higher compression ratios. So, oh, I'm going to say what a compression ratio is in a moment. So we compress, and this is why I, I drew it sort of steeper. It's sort of to show that the, the space between these two volumes is actually, is actually much bigger. So it's, we're reaching higher pressures. And what we do here, when we're at the top, then we have are some kind of combustion process. And that happens through fuel injection. So now I have these really high pressure, high temperature gas. In fact, it's, it's such a high temperature that when I inject the fuel, right away it starts burning. Hence, we call these compression ignition engines. It's the compression of the gas that leads to high temperatures that leads to combustion. So then we have fuel injection and it is injected in such a way, it takes a certain amount of time, this fuel injection, so this is injection plus combustion, it occurs at the same time, and it makes the, the it makes the, well, as soon as I'm injecting, the fluid starts to burn, and then it burns as we go through uh, the entire process, or the entire injection, and this doesn't, this doesn't, well, this occurs over a relatively slow or relatively long time. Um, and so there's actually movement of the piston at roughly constant pressure. So when we're done with the injection, the combustion ends, and then we expand the piston for the rest, for the rest of the stroke. So this is the uh, expansion stroke. And then we open the exhaust valve. Here I didn't write this as E I V O. We intake, uh, intake valve open, intake valve closed. Then we exit open the exhaust valve. We have again the blowdown. And then we have the exhaust stroke where we push the gas out. So again, there's two lines on top of each other. One goes this way, one goes that way. We have the intake, we have the exhaust. Here, I forgot to write the exhaust, like this, okay. And then we have the exhaust valve close, and then we start again. Good. Um, 
and now we well, well we kind of see the the we kind of see the the um, how could we call this? We kind of see our, our idealized thermodynamic cycles pop out. Whenever I have two lines on the thermodynamic process, if I have a line going straight across this way, and then it comes back over the exact same path, well, there's no net effect. So there's no, in the ideal world, there's no net effect from the exhaust and the intake. So I can actually, here, I'm going to put that in orange. I could actually kind of get rid of this part. And I can get rid of this part. All right. And then the blowdown, I'm going to approximate. Let's put that in blue. So the blowdown, we're going to approximate by heat extraction. The combustion, we're going to approximate by heat addition. And then we're going to assume that it's air everywhere. Assume air uh, everywhere in the cycle. We're going to do the same thing here. So I'm going to assume that the blowdown, this is, I like to write this Q out. Intake is Q in and assume air everywhere. What I've drawn in uh, in blue with the uh, getting rid of the exhaust and the intake, this is what we call the, so blue, this is the air standard approximation. Sort of a standard trick of dealing with thermodynamic cycles. Okay. Well, let's draw our, our perfect our perfect cycle in our TS or our temperature entropy diagrams. Okay, we're going to start our cycle. I like to, it's customary. I like to label this as our state one. And so this is low temperature, sort of ambient temperature. So I'm gonna be out here. This is my state one. And then we have compression. So let's remember what's a, well, now if I have compression, I'm going to neglect any kind of heat transfer. So I'm going to neglect heat losses from, for now, from the, the system to the outside through the compression and the expansion. So a path which has no heat losses. And I'm also going to assume uh, that there is no friction. There's no friction between the piston wall. There's no turbulence that is generating, that is sort of generating, well, these, these we call them irreversibilities. Right, so there's no irreversible process. So my process is actually reversible. So if I have the, that is the, if I, if I didn't do anything, if I didn't do any combustion, if I compress the piston and then I let it come down, I would come back to the exact same state. That's the definition of a reversible process. So I'm going to assume that my compression and my expansion, those are reversible, no friction, no turbulence, no viscosity, nothing. We just have pure compression and there's also no heat losses. So there's no heat transfer from the cylinder out or to, or from the outside to the cylinder. And this is what we call adiabatic. So if we assume that something is adiabatic and irreversible, we're going all the way back to like the beginning, the beginning, like the, the, the second week or the third week of your, of your undergraduate thermodynamics course. So if these processes, the compression is adiabatic and reversible, then it is also, that's by definition is what we call isentropic. So that means that from one to state two, these are isentropic processes. That is an anisentropic process like this. So it's a, actually here, I'm gonna draw it as a, I'm gonna draw it with a straight line tool so that there is no ambiguity. This is a straight up curve like this to state two. Well, then we have heat addition at, in the auto cycle, I compress and then the spark, boom, it burns so fast, the piston doesn't actually have time to move, doesn't move much. So this would be constant volume combustion, uh, which I've replaced by heat addition. So now this is heat addition at constant volume. So the temperature is going to go up and now there is heat transfer. So the entropy has to go up as well. And so it's going to go zoop, up like this to state three. I'm gonna label this one three. 
And this is a V is equal to a constant line. Q in. And then we have a, uh, yeah, this is from line three. And then we have another, well, we have the expansion phase. Again, I'm going to assume that there's no irreversibilities, no friction, no turbulence, no viscosity, nothing. And I'm also going to assume that there is no heat losses from the cylinder. This is wrong. I mean, the, the temperature inside the cylinder is really high. We're going to calculate this. We're going to actually calculate this throughout the semester. So I know there is heat lost in this process. I'm just going to assume it doesn't happen. Um, in that case, it's again an isentropic process. So I have a straight line down from state from state three. Boom, like that. To state four. Oh, this is a four. This is my state four there. And then I go from well state four to state one. I've replaced this with just heat extraction. And this is in this case at constant volume. So I'm just going to go down. Zoop, and then we come back to state one. This is again, V is equal to a constant Q out. And this is my idealized auto cycle in the TS plane. It's not as remarkable, you'll see. So here, when we do the diesel cycle, we start from state one. Again, it's low temperature, low pressure, low entropy. And then we compress, no heat losses, no irreversibility, so no friction, no nothing. So it's a reversible and adiabatic process. It's an isentropic process. So state two. Here I'm going to label them. This is state one, state two. Then we have heat addition, but it occurs. So here, see how we have heat addition at constant pressure. Oh. So now we have heat addition. Zoop. Except this is a P equals a constant line. Q in. So I'm adding heat, so entropy has to go up. Uh, but the pressure is constant, so the temperature also goes up, and then we end up with a higher pressure and a higher entropy. It kind of looks exactly the same. It turns out the slope of the constant volume and the constant pressure line are a little bit different. Then we have uh, our expansion stroke. I'm going to put a straight line for the rest of our expansion stroke, like this. And then we have a constant volume. constant volume process. So this is state three, state four. There we go. So this is Q is equal Q out. V is equal to a constant. So notice on the diesel cycle, we have one constant pressure and one constant volume process. On the auto cycle, we have two constant volume processes. So the TS diagrams aren't, I mean, extremely important, but they don't tell us as much. Like visually, I can't see the difference all that much. Um, for the uh, PV diagram, though, it's it's remarkable, right? And auto cycle, the combustion occurs as a straight vertical line. Uh, diesel cycle, it's a straight horizontal line. Okay. And that's the basics of our auto and diesel cycle. So let us uh, compute. We're going to compute some numbers. We're actually going to solve quickly two problems. Uh, before we do this, let me define two numbers. One I've talked about before. I'm going to draw it in. It's a nice color I haven't used yet. Blue I've used. Let's use uh, green. Let's use super flashy green. R, the compression ratio. So the compression ratio is the ratio of the bigger volume over the smaller volume. This number applies to both auto and diesel cycle. Actually here, can I? Just gonna, I'm gonna try to move this. Only that, there we go. So that ratio applies to both, or is extremely important for both the diesel and the auto cycle. I need to know what the compression ratio is. In fact, that's like the, the that's like the basic definition of those cycles. 
There's a second number for the diesel cycle, which is something we call the, uh, oh, I almost said compression ratio there. I was almost, uh, um, which is actually a number we like to call beta, which is this, it's also a ratio of volumes. It's the ratio of these two volumes here. Yeah, we're going to call this V3. So there's a second number. Beta is equal to V3 over V2. This one is also an extremely important ratio, but you should uh, keep in mind um, that beta is not, it is not a, uh, an independent ratio. So R, the compression ratio, it's a geometric, it's a geometric ratio. It's actually like the, it's like the heart and definition of your, of the, 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 the physical shape of your engine. If you know R, at least in thermodynamics, for the, as far as the thermodynamics is concerned. So if you need to know how your engine looks, like it's got to have like a certain, well, it has to have a certain diameter and it has to have a certain length that the piston is going to move. This is what we call the stroke. And so that defines the volumes and so on. And it's got to have a certain top position and bottom position. And these all lead to defining R, the compression ratio, which is a, a it's a choice. You can build any size cylinder you want. Beta is actually related to the amount of heat that you're dumping in. And we'll see how to uh, compute it. Actually, we like to call it, this has a name, this is called the cutoff ratio. So it's actually, a, it's, actually a, 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 it's a measure of actually how much fuel you're dumping in or how much energy you're adding into uh, the diesel cycle. So this is not independent. Um, okay, and that's it. This is the this is all the numbers we want to talk about. So I'm going to erase all of this, and we're going to I'm going to clear the drawings, and we're going to do two examples. So example auto cycle. Okay. Gonna to go to the top of my notes here. Um, here I'm gonna pick a different color. I'm gonna draw in blue. Okay, so consider. Okay, so consider an uh, an auto cycle powered engine. Uh, this is a four stroke with a compression ratio with a compression ratio of R is equal to what did I pick 10. So the ratio of the large volume to the small volume is a factor of 10. So if you start at one liter, you end up at 0.1 liter. Okay, um, the initial pressure and temperature at the start of compression are P1 is equal to 0 0.1 megapascal, that is 100 kilopascals, so basically ambient pressure, and T1 is equal to 15 degrees Celsius, a little bit cold. All right, so calculate um, P, T, and V, the specific volume, at all four states. as well as the as well as the thermodynamic efficiency okay um, all of this 
I am. So all of this I'm going to condense into uh, a plot. So here I'm going to put it in black. So I'm going to write this. So I'm going to condense all of this. I'm just going to start erasing. This is so if I was in an exam, I would see. Uh, I would see this. I'm just going to erase all of this text. I'm going to condense this into engineering speak. Uh, let, me condense, let me let me erase, erase, erase. I just want room. Okay. So in engineering speak. If an engineer is talking to me about, oh, yeah, we have an engine. It runs on an auto cycle. Look, I'm just going to start drawing this. It's an auto cycle. It's spark ignited. One, two, three, four. This is my PV diagram. And uh, when it compresses, it's 0.1 megapascal. And T1 is 15 degrees Celsius. And it's compression ratio of... 10, like this. Um, and the, oh, I, I forgot to actually write this in the description, but we're going to assume that the amount of heat that is liberated, so the amount of heat that is liberated by the, the, the chemical energy is 1800 kilojoules per kilogram. So it's Q in. So every time one kilogram of air and fuel mixture burns, this liberates 1800 kilojoules per kilogram, um, like that. And that's pretty much it. This is all we need. OK, so I can I can finish erasing this. This is all of this big block of text. This is all encompassed into this uh, picture there. All right, so we want to find pressure. I'm going to write them in megapascal. We want to find temperature in Oh, heck, let's put it in degrees Celsius. And specific volume, put it in meter cubed per kilogram, right? The specific volume is the volume of the system divided by the mass contained. Okay, then we're just gonna draw a couple of vertical lines. Whoop, so it's a table like this. Okay, I already have some information I know we start at 0 0.1 megapascal and 15 degrees Celsius. Uh, what's the specific volume? I'm going to assume here, I'm going to make a little box here. Assumptions. I'm going to assume that this is an ideal gas. Ideal gas. Um, okay, so if it's an ideal gas, then uh, step one, so find specific volume at one. Uh, this is an ideal gas, so base PV is equal to RT. So that means, let's see, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to turn this around. So V is equal to RT over P. Whoops. T over P. And so that gives me V1 is equal to RT1 over P1. So it's going to be equal to, and the value of R, this is, I don't really have to, I don't necessarily have to write this as an assumption, but this is air standard. So R is that of air. And if you remember, it's 0 0.287 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. This is the specific value of R. OK. So let's compute this. I actually think in my solution, I did not compute this. So this is 0 0.287 kilojoules per kilogram times, oh, and remember, whenever I'm using the ideal gas law, I have to use Kelvins, always, always, always Kelvin. So 0.287 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin times 15 degrees Celsius plus 273. So this is 288 Kelvin divided by 0 0.1 megapascal. This is 100 kilopascals. It's equal to 0.287 times 288 divided by 100. This gives me. 0 0.8266. And what are the units? The Kelvin, here I'm going to hash those in red. So Kelvins go with Kelvin. Kilojoules, a kilopascal is a kilonewton. This is a kilonewton per meter squared. So I'm going to add a meter, meter cubed. 
uh, and a Newton meter as a joule. So this is kilojoules per meter cube. So the kilojoules go with the kilojoules. So this is meter cube per kilogram. There you go. So I've got the first specific volume, 0 0.8266. OK, this is at state 1. There we go. So I can actually already fill in. I can fill in the. I can fill in the specific volume. For the other three states, state two. Well, it's a ratio of ten, right? I said that we're compressing by a factor of ten. The volume goes down by a factor of ten, and the definition of specific volume is volume over mass. And this is a constant mass system, but right? we're we're starting at a certain uh, bottom dead center volume, all in all valves closed, compress, we come all the way up to the top, burn, come all the way back to the bottom, the mass has never changed, then we extract heat, I have the same mass. So that means that if I reduce the volume by a factor of 10, I reduce the specific volume by a factor of 10. So at state two, this is 0 0.08266. At state three, the volume is constant, the mass is constant, 0 0.08266. And at state four, the volumes come back to our original volume, 0 0.8266. There we go. OK, we have V1. Now we want to find P1 and T1. We're going to do this by following the path from state one to state two. And how do I do this? I like to, when I teach the undergraduate courses, um, I like to say, well, this is solving a thermodynamic cycle. It's kind of like solving a puzzle. So which, um, where do I want to start? Right? Do I want to start going from state one to state two or from state three to state four? Or where do I want to start? Well, think of it this way. What I, uh, or one rule that you can keep in your head is that I can do something with a thermodynamic path if I know two thermodynamic variables at one state and one thermodynamic variable at the other state. So for example, here at state one, I know two thermodynamic variables. I know pressure and temperature. And as soon as I know two independent intensive thermodynamic variable, although we're only going to be dealing with gases in this uh, in this particular class of cycles in this course. So that distinction isn't as important. But I, as soon as I know two independent intensive thermodynamic variables, such as P1 and T1, then I know everything about the state. I know V1. I know the entropy at one. I can calculate. I know the internal energy at one. I know everything there is to know. I know something, I know something about the path. I know that along this path, S is equal to a constant. And I know something about the end state. And the end state is the volume at two is one tenth of the volume at one. So I actually know V2. I know V2 because I know V1, or I should say I know specific volume at two. Turns out you don't need the actual volume. So I don't need to know how big the cylinder is, if it's a huge cylinder or if it's a tiny cylinder. OK, so I know the, let's see. So I know two things at one end of the thermodynamic path. right? I know P1 and T1. I know one thing at the other end. I know V2. And I know the path itself. I know that S is equal to a constant. So I actually know everything. I can solve everything I want. So let's see. So we're going to follow. So path. One, two, two, constant entropy compression. Well, we have an ideal gas, and we know it's constant entropy. You might remember, so for constant entropy path or an isentropic process for ideal gas, so isentropic process for an ideal gas, that implies PV to the K is equal to a constant, where K 
is the adiabatic index. So a good rule of thumb, if I'm dealing with air, if I don't know what K is, so for example, in this problem, I didn't give a value of K, a good first order approximation is that it's equal to 1.4. And this is true for any, uh, it's actually, so K is equal to 1.4 is a good approximation for any diatomic gas. So O2, right? Oxygen is one O, one o atom, one O atom. N2 is nitrogen, one N atom, one N atom. So any diatomic gas, K is roughly 1.4 when I'm around room temperature. So if I don't know what the value of K is, a good first guess is K is equal to 1.4. So I've added it into my assumptions box here. And I'm going to use this. I'm going to use this relationship for the isentropic process of an ideal gas. This is valid all throughout the path from one to two. That means it applies at the end state. P1 V1 to the K is equal to P2 V2 to the K. Uh, okay, so I can rewrite this. This means P2 is equal to P1 V1 over V2 to the K. Well, V1 is VBDC. This is the specific volume at the bottom dead center. This is the specific volume at the top dead center. So it means this is equal to P1 VBDC over VTDC. And I could multiply the top and bottom by mass so that they become big volumes. Uh, but then that is my compression ratio. So it's P1 R to the K. Ooh, this is actually why R is so important. So now that means I can calculate P2. P2 is equal to 0 0.1 megapascals multiplied by 10 to the 1.4. And if we compute that answer, we're going to find that P2 is equal to 2.512 megapascals. So there I can put that in 2.512. Now I actually have two different ways uh, of getting T2. Right now I have an ideal gas and I know the pressure and I know the temperature, or sorry, I know the pressure and I know the specific volume, I could get the temperature. I can get T2 is equal to P2V2 over R. So I could, I could punch that in and I should get that T2 is equal to 723.42 Kelvin. Um, there's another way, which I, I, I don't know, I kind of prefer so that in this case, I forced you to get uh, through the problem description, I forced calculating the specific volume, but otherwise you don't actually need to calculate them. The, I can take this isentropic relation for an ideal gas with P and V, and I can get rid of P. I know that for an ideal gas, P is equal to RT over V. This is always true. Therefore, I can replace for P1, this is going to be R. T1 over V1 times V1 to the K is going to be equal to RT2 over V2 times V2 to the K. Well, I can combine the Vs. This becomes V1 to the K minus 1. This becomes V2 to the K minus 1. And R is equal to R. I can get rid of this. And then I get T1. Oh, look at that. I can actually rewrite this. This is T2 is equal to T1 times V1 over V2 to the K minus one, which is equal to T1 times the compression ratio to the K minus one. And if I punch that in, I get the exact same answer. So we get 723.42, so 723.4, roughly. Okay, now I want the pressure at three, the temperature at three. Okay, now this is a little bit, uh, this is a little bit harder. Well, no, it's not a little bit harder. Uh, it's it's just a different path, really. Okay, so I'm going to erase a little bit of stuff here so I have some room to work with. Uh, I'm going to keep my numbers there. Okay, so path one to two. Here, I'm going to keep it from here. So I'm going to do path. 
two to three. This is heat addition at constant volume. Okay. So path one to two, I use this expression over here. PV to the K is equal to a constant. I use that directly. This implies a certain process beforehand, a certain mathematical process. That equation implies that you've written down the first law of thermodynamics, you canceled out a bunch of things, and then you reworked it to express entropy, and then you set S is equal to a constant, or S1 equals to S2, and then you ended up with this particular relation in the end, far down in the end. But it takes a long, it takes a relatively long time to go through this derivation, so you don't want to do it every time. There are paths for which the full thermodynamic analysis process is much faster. So instead of remembering those by heart, um, even though at some point you sort of learn those by heart, but instead of remembering those by heart, those ones you can sort of just do them again. I mean, the isentropic process, the analysis is really long. The other ones, I can't be bothered to learn them by heart. So two to three, the path from two to three is one of those that I don't remember by heart and it's a constant volume process. So what is this? This is I have a chunk of gas at a certain volume and I add heat to it, so Q in, so that at the final time I have the same volume of gas at a different temperature. So I'm gonna write my first law for this system that I've drawn in black there. And the first law of thermo, this is a closed system, it says that the change of energy is equal to the amount of heat going in minus the amount of work done by the system. And the change of energy, well, it's gonna be the energy at the end, or actually in this case, it's gonna be roughly equal to delta U, the change in internal energy. So this assumes that we've, assumes we neglect kinetic energy, potential energy, and so on. So the total energy of my system is always the internal energy plus uh, a half times the mass, the volume, uh, the velocity squared. This is a velocity squared of the system plus the mass times G times the height of the system. So this is, I'm neglecting all of these. These should be changes really. So change of kinetic energy, change of potential energy. I'm neglecting everything. I'm assuming this is not moving anywhere. There's not, any like turbulent motion. I'm assuming there's not crazy turbulent motion in there. Okay, so the change in total energy is equal to the change in internal energy. Um, for a simple substance, delta U then is then equal to Q in minus, and the work done by the system for a simple substance, and a simple substance is one that I can only interact with it through what we call boundary work right, through compressing it or allowing it to expand. That's the only way I can interact with that. Um, it's the only way that I can interact with that fluid. And the work done is n equal to the integral of P dV. V is volume from V1, or in this case from V2 to V3. Okay. Well, except the volume doesn't change, right? From two to three, it's the exact same volume. So there is no work done because at constant volume, there, yeah, it's by definition, at constant volume, if it's a substance that I can only interact with through mechanical work, mechanical boundary work, so no magic, no, 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 um, um, no magnetic fields that are gonna affect the substance, right? There's no, I can't, I can't change the internal energy of this thing except through boundary work. And then there is no work if its volume doesn't change. <clears throat> Excuse me, so that means that all of the heat that is added to this system goes into raising the internal energy. So Q in is gonna be equal to mass of the system times the change. So U at the end minus U, whoops, U3 minus U2. This is delta U, so change of the system. Final internal energy minus the initial internal energy. And you'll notice I've, I split off the mass, so this is these are specific internal energy, and I took out a mass in front uh, because I want to do this. I go Q in over M 
is equal to u3 minus u2. And I was a little bit, I was a little bit um, uh, sloppy here. I put in a big Q for the, the heat transfer in, which is 1800 kilojoules per kilogram, but it's a specific heat transfer. If I was consistent with my own personal notation, I would have put a little Q there. So little Q in, that's the amount of heat done per kilogram. Um, most people are, are often sloppy and we'll just put in, I'm just gonna undo this. You sort of have to get used to it because I'm gonna slip many times during the course. So Q in is the uh, sort of, we'll use the same large Q for um, uh, sort of absolute work you know, in, in joules and kilojoules, as well as specific work in joules per kilogram or kilojoules per kilogram. Okay, so I want to do this where Q in over M is equal to U3 minus U2, which is the change in specific internal energy. And for an ideal gas, oh, an ideal gas, I'm going to assume as well that specific heats are constant. Specific heats are constant. So CP, CV constant. So now this is a definition. By definition for an ideal gas with constant specific heat, uh, the change in internal energy is equal to CV T3 minus T2. It's by definition, this is what we call it, the definition of a perfect gas. Cool. I know Q in over M, that's 1800 kilojoules per kilogram. Uh, CV, I'm gonna calculate it in a minute. I know T2, so I can find T3. So therefore T3 is equal to T2 plus Q in over mass divided by CV. Okay. What is, what's CV? It's just a little trip down memory lane. For an ideal gas, CP minus CV is equal to R. So this is recall. So let me divide by uh, CV in this case. So what I want is CV. So if I don't remember what I'm giving you now, this recall, this is a trick. If you, well, it's not a trick, but it's a, it's a quick way of, of getting a value. If you don't remember what is the value of CV or CP, or you don't know what to take, you can always compute it. So I know that this top row, this top of the line here, this is always true for an ideal gas. Actually, that's, a, that's, a, that's not even an approximation. If you have an ideal gas, this is true. CP minus CV is equal to R. Even if CP and CV change with temperature, this still has to be true. I'm going to divide that expression by the thing that I want a value for. So in this case, I want CV. I'm gonna divide by CV. So on the left, I get CP over CV minus one is equal to R over CV. And actually uh, CP over CV, that's the definition of K, right? K is equal to 1.4. K is CP divided by CV. So that means this is equal to K minus one. So I can rewrite this differently. Well, I get CV is equal to R, the specific R. I'm going to put a little SP. So we're, well, actually, it doesn't actually matter. Take out the SP. It could be per kilogram or per mole. So it's R divided by K minus 1, like this. Awesome. So now I can compute it. I know that for air, R is 0.287. So CV is equal to, I assumed K is equal to 1.4. So 0.287 divided by 1.4 minus 1 divided by 0.4 we get something that's like 0 0.7175 and kilojoules. So this is 0 0.287 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin divided by 0 0.4. Let me just repunch it in just to make sure. 0 0.287 divided by 0 0.4. Yep, 0 0.7175. And the units are kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. There you go. So if I assume, if I have a perfect gas and I assume a value for K, then I've automatically assumed a value for CV. Okay, so let's finish computing. 
let's finish computing our um, the value of T3. So what's T3? Is it going to be equal to T2? 723.4 plus uh, Qint, 1800 kilojoules per kilogram divided by, this is, sorry, Kelvin, divided by the value of CV, 0 0.7175 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin, kilojoules per kilogram, kilojoules per Kelvin works out. So T3 is equal to, I'm just going to punch it in there very quickly, and we find that <clears throat> T3 is equal to 3232.13 Kelvin. 20. There we go. I still want the pressure. Well, it's an ideal gas. So I know that PV is equal to RT actually holds at all time. So I know that P3V3 is equal to RT3. This has to be true. This also has to be true. Where I'm gonna. This also has to be true at state two. Well, I can come and divide one by the other. I can get rid of this line. Here, I'm gonna put my equal sign a little bit later, uh, further down, Boop, like this, and that works. So R is a constant because it's a property of the matter. V3 is equal to V2 because it's constant volume. So then I find that P3 is equal to P2. T3 over T2. And if we put the numbers, so 2.512 megapascals and the ratio of the temperatures, 3232.1 over 723.4, we find that P3 is 11.22 megapascals. Huge. Good. Well, now, let's see. Now we want state four. Oh, that's all we're missing. Hey, hold on. Can I can I do a delete on these things? If I select everything, to... nah. Oh, but I can make them smaller, and then it's a little bit faster to erase. I think. Not really. Okay. I have not found a good way to erase faster in Zoom. OK. All right, so now we have the path from 3 to 4. Oop. So path 3 to 4, because I want state 4. Now that one is, again, it's constant entropy expansion. So that means that our isentropic, it's still an ideal gas. It's still a perfect gas. So that means that our isentropic equation still works. So P3 V3 to the K is equal to P4 V4 to the K. And I want P4. So P4 is equal to P3 V3 over V4 to the K. And V3 is the volume at two is the small volume. So this is P3. V bottom uh, small volume, V top dead center over, and V4 is equal to V1 is the big volume. This is volume at bottom dead center to the K. This is the inverse of R. So this is P3, 1 over R to the K. So I punch this in. So P3 is equal to 11.22 multiplied by 0 0.1 to the 1.4. And if I calculate all of this, I'm just going to cheat and scroll down to my solution. I find that the pressure at the end of the expansion uh, period is 0.447 megapascal. It's higher than atmospheric. It's higher than the, the, the pressure that I started with, which was 100 kilopascal. So that's a 450. This is why when you open the exhaust valve, and it exhaust is a rush of gas out. So we have the same thing for temperature. P3, V3 to the K minus 1 
is equal to T4 V4 to the K minus one. So T4 is equal to T3 times one over R to the K minus one. And if I punch this in, we'll get 1286.7 Kelvin. And yes, I could have gotten this with P4 and V4, then I could have gotten T4, exact same answer. All right. Um, we have, we have all the states. The only part of the question we haven't done is finding what is the, what is the, uh, efficiency. Okay. And by efficiency, we mean, well, so in this course, we're dealing with power production cycles, right? Where there, there are thermodynamic cycles that produce a net amount of work out to give us either you know, something we can put into a generator to get electricity or something that we can, uh, that we can uh, use to, well, it's, it's internal combustion engines for vehicular internal combustion engines. So something that I can use to move a vehicle along. So the thermodynamic efficiency uh, is going to be equal to the net amount of work out or work net out of my cycle divided by the amount of heat coming in. So now I need to know what's the net amount of work. So I'm going to write the first law for the path one to two. And we'll find that. So delta u, I'm going to neglect the kinetic energy and potential energy right away. Delta u is equal to q in minus the work from one to two. And this is the work out from one to two. And well, we said this is isentropic, so it's adiabatic and reversible. This is zero. Adiabatic means no heat transfer. <coughs> Excuse me. And we find that the work out from one to two, I keep writing the out. We have to remember the direction. This is equal to minus delta U. So the negative of the change of energy. So this is U1 minus U2. So on the unit mass basis, this is equal to U1 minus U2, which is equal to, uh, let's see, this is going to be equal to CV T1 minus T2. I don't think in my uh, solution I computed the works. Uh, oh, I did. So that actually gives us a value of minus 312.41 kilojoules per kilogram. So remember T1, we've computed T1 is 15 degrees Celsius. Oh, I put them in degrees Celsius. I forgot to retranslate the other ones. So T1 is 15 degrees Celsius, which is 288 Kelvin. Actually here, I'm gonna cheat just so I don't stay up all night. So this is the temperature in Kelvin. There we go. Um, so it's 288 Kelvin and T2 is 723 is actually higher. That means we get negative work. So a negative work out, that actually means that it's work that has to go into the system. And indeed the piston is compressing the gas. So the piston is doing work on the gas. So this is what going into the system. Uh, we can write the first law for the path from three to four which is the only other path that actually has work done, right? So one to two is work in, two to three is constant volume, the work. Three to four, that's work out, is work. And four to one is constant volume again, so there's no work. So I'll find delta U is equal to Q in minus the work out from three to four. It's isentropic, Q in is equal to zero. So I get that the work out from three to four is equal to minus delta U is equal to, uh, I'm gonna put it on per unit mass. This becomes specific internal energy. So it's minus CV T3 minus T4, initial minus final. Oh, sorry, minus delta U. Yeah, I'm just gonna put a plus, there you go. Minus delta U becomes, oh, 
It's confusing. So let me do it properly. So this is minus delta u is equal to minus the change in internal energy, final minus initial, u4 minus u3. But there's a minus sign, so this is equal to u3 minus u4. So it's equal to Cv T3 minus T4. Which in this case, while T3 is 3,000 something and T4 is 1,200 something, so T3 is higher, so this is going to be greater than zero. So now this is actually, if you compute it, this is going to be 1395.85 kilojoules per kilogram. There we go. So we can punch that all, everything in. So eta is equal to minus 312.41 kilojoules per kilogram plus 1395.85 kilojoules per kilogram. This is the net amount of work. So work going in plus the work going out divided by Q in. How much heat did I input? Well, that was given by the problem. 1800 kilojoules per kilogram. So punch all of that in, we find that the thermal efficiency is 0 0.602, 60.2%. There we go. And that's it for the auto cycle. Hey, let's try to do one quickly. Let's try to do example diesel cycle. So let's assume that we have, uh, so now let's solve diesel cycle. We're going to do basically exactly the same problem, um, except now Oh, except we're going to do exactly the same problem, except not. <laughs> the numbers are a little bit different in the problem that I picked. Okay, so let's do a diesel cycle, specific volume pressure. So I'm not going to write a whole statement. So consider a compression ignition engine with a compression ratio of 20. I'm making it higher. In the other one, we said a compression ratio of 10. But for diesel engines, a compression ratio is typically higher. So for the purpose of illustrating real life problems, I'm going to make this compression ratio higher. Uh, the temperature and pressure at the start of, combust of compression are 89 kilopascals and temperature of 320 Kelvin. We compress to state two. We burn at constant pressure three. And then we expand out to state four. And then we close back to state one. I'm going to put arrows to remind ourselves that this cycle goes into this direction. Okay. Assume again it's air as an ideal gas with uh, constant specific heats. Find all the temperatures and pressures. Find the cutoff ratio. Um, so find, well, here, I'm just going to build my table right away. So find all the temperatures and the pressures throughout the cycle. I'm going to omit the, uh, specific volumes because as we've seen, we don't really need them. So for state one, two, three, and four. So temperatures, pressures, I'm going to put the temperatures in Kelvin. I'm going to put the pressures in uh, kilopascals. Make a little change. Okay. And then we find the cutoff ratio, beta, and we want to find the efficiency as well. Okay. Put in red. I'm going to draw my little assumption box again. That assumptions box is actually the most important thing of any solution you're making. This is telling you in what range is your solution actually valid. So this is true for school problems. This is true for real life problem. You're talking to colleagues. I always want to have this little assumptions box because I want to be able to specify, you know, what I'm saying up to which point is it actually uh, a valid case. Uh, all right, so fuel is injected at constant pressure. So let's see, let me start again. Consider a compression ignition engine with a compression ratio of 20. 
temperature and pressure at the start of compression are 320 and 89. So I can put those in already. Uh, fuel is injected at constant pressure to an equivalent heat input of 1800 kilojoules per kilogram of mixture. Find all temperatures and pressures, cutoff ratio, network, and efficiency. Uh, assume air standard R is equal to 0.287. CP is equal to 1.005 and K is equal to 1.4. So I'm going to write these. So R is 0.287 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. K is 1.4. CP 1.005 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. I could check, but these three values have to be consistent, and indeed they are. Okay. Uh, well, it starts very, very similarly to before. So from one to two, this is one to, oops, what color, I'm going to go back to black. One to two, this is S is equal to a constant and compression. So P2 is equal to P1 times R to the K. If I punch that in, we find that P2 is equal to, so P1 is 89 kilopascals times 20 to the 1.4. So we get 5899.7 kPa, and T2 is equal to T1 times R to the K minus 1. So we get this is 320 Kelvin multiplied by 20 to the 0 0.4. That's going to give me 1060.6 Kelvin. 6 and 5899.7. KPA. Uh, two to three, this is pressure is equal to a constant heat addition. Okay. Um, let's see, pressure is equal to a constant. Well, this is another one of those where I don't like to recall by heart um, sort of what's the equation that I'm supposed to use. I'm, I just want to do it. So actually, so now I have a system. I'm going to add heat into this. But now volumes are constant, pressure is constant. So as, as I'm heating it up, it's going to want to expand because the pressure wants to go up when you heat something. So it's going to be at a bigger volume at the end of the process. This is two to three. So I'm going to write my first law. The change of internal energy, again, I'm going to neglect for now kinetic energy, potential energy, is going to be equal to Q in minus the work done by the system. And for a simple fluid, we said this is the integral from V2 to V3 of P dV. Pressure is constant. That means I can pull the pressure out of the integral. It means that this is delta U is equal to Q in minus P, whatever is P2, P3, it's the same thing. Put P2. Integral of dV is just V. It's going to be V3 minus V2. Uh, I'm going to rewrite this. Actually, here, I'm going to turn this around a little bit. I say Q in is equal to the change in internal energy. This is going to be U3 minus U2 plus P2V3 minus, uh, oh, sorry. Nope, sorry, there's going to be a, a, a plus. I'm going to turn this into the other side. So plus P2V3 minus P2V2. So this becomes Q in is equal to, here I'm going to put the almost like terms together. So it's U3 plus P2V3 minus U2 minus P2V2. Here I'm going to put it in bracket. If you remember, again, your first class in thermodynamics, U plus PV is a really important combination of variables because that's the enthalpy. So U2 plus P2V2, that is the enthalpy at 2. U3 plus P2V3, that is almost the enthalpy at 3. Um, well, P2 is equal to P3. It's constant pressure. So I can replace this. This pressure is equal to P3. So this term is actually U3 plus P3V3. So this is also the enthalpy at 3. Q in 
Some of you may have decided to remember by heart Qn is equal to delta H. This is only true at constant P. If you're not at constant pressure, this is not true. I'm going to do it per unit mass. Qn over M is equal to H3 minus H2. And for an ideal gas, by definition, just like the change in internal energy is equal to Cv delta T, for the change in enthalpy, it is now Cp T3 minus T2. So now we can rewrite this. That means that T3 is equal to T2 plus Q in over M, the heat input per mass, divided by Cp. And I wrote to write this down. I forgot to write this down here, but the specific amount of heat input was actually given in the problem. It was, again, 1,800 kilojoules per kilogram. So that means that T3 is equal to T2. I know what that is, 1,060.6. Kelvin plus 1800 kilojoules per kilogram divided by 1.005 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. These go, Kelvins work out. So then my temperature at three, I've punched this in before, is actually 2851.6 Kelvin. 2851.6. And the pressure is constant, so I actually know P3. It's five eight. 99.7. Awesome. Beta is equal to the ratio of V3 over V2. I don't know any volumes, but it turns out I don't actually need to know the volumes. I don't need to know the absolute volumes, the absolute values of the volume. All I need to know is the ratio of the two. So beta, uh, pop, 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 pop. okay, stop here. So beta is equal to V3 over V2, which is equal to specific volume of three over specific volume of two, because the system contains a fixed amount of mass. So I can divide by mass on the top and bottom. All right, well, again, ideal gas law holds everywhere for this, right? So P3, V3, whoops, this is a V, V3 is equal to, uh, whoops, do it on a specific basis. So P3, V3 is equal to RT3. This is true at state two as well, RT2. So the ratio, well, R is R, it's a constant. Pressure is constant. So P3 over P2 is just equal to one. So that means that V3 over V2, which is equal to beta by definition, is equal to T3 over T2, the ratio of temperatures. So 2851.6 Kelvin over 1060.6 Kelvin. So the value of beta is equal to 2.689, which is a pretty good value, actually, somewhere like there, 2.5 to 3 is a typical value. Now, notice this is not, so we've actually calculated beta from the initial, uh, from the initial data of the problem. So beta didn't, like, it's not something that we picked. Beta was actually a consequence. So in order to add 1,800 kilojoules per kilogram, the value of beta had to be 2.689. Um, no, state four. Let's do state four. So three to four, now it's not constant volume. It's isentropic. So that means that P3, uh, hold on, sorry. That means that P4V4 to the K 
is equal to P3V3 to the K. So P4 is equal to P3 V3 over V4 to the K. This is very close to what we had for the auto cycle, except V4 over V3 is not the compression ratio, right? This is the bottom dead center volume, V4 divided by V3, but V4 over V2 would be the, uh, the compression ratio. But I can play a trick. This is equal to, oops, sorry, it's equal to P3. And then I'm gonna put V3 over V2, V2 over V4, right? I can divide and multiply by the same thing on both sides. And V3 over V2, that's beta. So P3 beta over R to the K. V4 over V2 is R. This is one over R. V3 over V2, this is beta. There we go. So now I can punch this in. So P4 is gonna be P3, 5899.7 KPA multiplied by 2.689 over 20 to the K. And that will give us a pressure at four of 355.48 KPA. Temperature at four, by now you might see the, the sort of the symmetry. Uh, so T4 is gonna be equal to T3, V3 over V4 to the K minus one. So if you look at the symmetry, this bit here, the ratio is the same V3 over V4. So that's going to be T3 beta over R to the K minus one. Yay, touch that in, 1277.95 Kelvin. There we go. So now I have all four states. I can get the net amount of work. So let's see. So the net amount of work it's going to be equal to the work in the compression, uh, the compression stroke from one to two, plus here, there's going to have to be something in between here, but the work in the expansion stroke, the work from three to four. And now we have to not forget there is work between two and three, right? Constant volume gives me zero work. In the auto cycle, there was no work during combustion because it was at constant volume from two to three. In the diesel cycle, now there is work because it's at constant pressure and not at constant volume. Yes, okay. So another way to see this is that the, the work is the integral of PDV. So it's the area, it's the area under the curve, right? So in the PV plane, all of this here, that is the area from one to two. That's the area under the curve from one to two. And it's a negative area. I know a negative area is kind of weird, but I'm integrating going left. So whenever the, the path moves to the left, it's a negative area. So that's the area, that's the amount of work done during compression. Here I'm gonna draw in red two to three. That's the area under the curve in red. That's hatch, hashed out in red. And now it's a positive area because I'm going to the right, expanding volume. So that's the amount of work coming out during the combustion phase. And then I'm going to put it not in red. I'm going to put it in blue. Three to four. Here's the area from three to four. So this is blue. This is blue area. This is red area. This is black area. There we go. So how do we compute these? Okay, so uh, well, I'm gonna do them in sequence. So work from one to two. I'm gonna write the first law. 
for the compression phase. Delta U is equal to Q in minus the work out from one to two. It's adiabatic because it's isentropic. So that means that the work from one to two is equal to negative of delta U. So it's going to be equal to U1 minus U2. On a mass basis, whoop, on a mass basis, this is going to be equal to U1 minus U2. CV, T1 minus T2. CV. Why CV? Because it's the work from one to two divided by M is equal to U1 minus U2. It's a difference of internal energy. So it's CV. Okay. So point, oh, I could compute. Well, I have R and CP. So if I can compute, I can compute CV is equal to CP minus R by definition. I'm gonna find this as 0.7175 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. I'm not putting it in red because that's not really an assumption. I'm just, I can compute this from the value of R and of CP. So if I punch this in, I have T1, I have T2. I'll find that the work from one to two is negative 531.75 kilojoules per kilogram. So work from two to three. It would be annoying to use, actually it would be circular to use the first law. In this case, because it's constant pressure, I can actually just go straight and integrate the definition of the work. Boundary work is equal to integral from V2 to V3 of PDV. And actually we've done this integral in order to get the enthalpy and so on. So in order to get, to get T3. So the pressure is constant, so I can pull it out. So it's P2 or three, same value multiplied by V3 minus V2. Oh my, I don't have the volumes. Well, now this is the big V by definition. Let me do this per mass. I'm gonna divide by mass, one over mass, I'm divide by mass, so this becomes P, whatever, P3, V3 minus V2. Oh, this is actually not so bad. Look at that, P3, V3. Remember the ideal gas law. So P3, V, this is P3, V3 minus P3, V2. Well, P3, V3 is just R times T3 and P3 V2, this P3 is equal to P2 and P2 V2 is equal to minus R T2. So this is just equal to R T3 minus T2. So if we punch that in, uh, oh, actually I didn't do it separately in my, um, I didn't do it. Uh, uh, I didn't do it separately in my solution, so I'm just going to punch it in. I'm going to get 0.287 times T3, 2851.6 minus T2, 1060.6. I get 514. Point zero one blah zero two kilojoules per kilogram because R is kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin times Kelvin units work out. Okay. The work from three to four. I'm, I'm going to do it the same way I did from one to two. So this is going to be equal to delta U is equal to Q in minus the work from three to four. Well, it's adiabatic. So the work from three to four is going to be equal to minus delta U from three to four. So it's going to be equal to U3 minus U4. I'm going to do it on a mass basis. And get that the specific amount of work is going to be equal to CV. Again, this is a difference in internal energy. So CV 
T3 minus T4. Let me compute these independently. I'll get that T3 is 2851.6 minus 1277.95 multiplied by 0.7175. I'll get 1129.1 kil uh, kilojoules per kilogram. So let me just make sure. So if I add 514.02, I get 1643 point something. Yep, exact same answer. So then we find that the net amount of work is just going to be the sum of the three. So 514.02 plus 1129.1. That gives me 1643 point something kilojoules per kilogram. That's the amount of work out minus. I have to add the amount of work that went in, the negative number. So plus negative 531.75. I get 1111. That's a nice number. 0.36 kilojoules per kilogram. That's the sum of this number, that number, and where is it? This number over here. So the net amount of work is equal to 1111.4 kilojoules per kilogram. And then here, I'm just, just take a little bit of space here. Cycle efficiency is the net amount of work over, it's the useful output over the input I had to put in. So it's gonna be equal to 1111 point something divided by 1800 kilojoules per kilogram, 61.74%. And congratulations, we have just reviewed everything we knew from uh, your undergraduate thermodynamics courses. Okay.